Welcome everyone to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources um, at the University of Kentucky and we have a huge show lined up for you today and some of it is um, a different series and some yeah. of it's a little creepy on the Halloween edition. <laughs> no doubt Renee, uh, you know we are getting close to the Halloween um, date so uh, we do have a couple of feature segments on some of the kind of maybe creepy things you might think of but uh, hopefully we'll demystify some of that creepiness for you all. Um, you know, it, it's wonderful to have you all with us. So whether you're joining us via Zoom or Facebook Live, we're delighted to have you with us um, today. And um, please, um, if you have the questions, um, use the chat pod via Zoom or use the comment section on Facebook Live and we'll get to those as quickly as possible. All right. So I guess for this Halloween edition, this one is not Halloween-y, <laughs> I guess if that's a word, um, but we're going to do our uh, next installment of Forestry 101. Yeah, so Jacob Muller, and I don't know if Jacob can get on for a second, but we got you queued up, Jacob, but another kind of um, continuation in this Forestry 101 series. Yep, yep. And so uh, today we're going to be introducing uh, silviculture, which I think really helps um, us think about kind of the context of forestry as we've gone through this, this series of Forestry 101, and we've talked about forest inventory um, and some uh, management planning, but now we're really bringing those together uh, and talking about what silviculture is and some of the, the major components of silviculture before we uh, talk next episode about um, developing your own um, forest woodland stewardship plan. All right, so Jacob, again, thanks for doing these. And Renee, without any further ado, I'll go ahead and stop my video and audio and we'll pull up his. Welcome back to Forestry 101. Uh, today we're going to be talking about silviculture. Uh, and silviculture is the art and science of controlling the establishment, the growth, the competition, the health, uh, and really the quality of the forest uh, in order to meet specific uh, landowner management objectives. So to accomplish this, uh, we do different activities such as uh, thinning and harvesting and planting uh, to regenerate the forest. Uh, we tend the forest to make sure that the growing stock that is left in the forest uh, is of the healthiest uh, and highest quality uh, trees and the most desirable species. And so when we think about forestry, we're really thinking about controlling the species composition, the structure uh, of the forest, uh, and, and the density of the forest. And we can all do these things through silvicultural activities. So these silvicultural activities uh, are generally called treatments. Uh, and we talk about the long-term planning. These treatments uh, are set uh, in process uh, through uh, prescriptions, silvicultural prescriptions. Uh, and generally, uh, when we're developing a silvicultural prescription, uh, we're gonna define it in the context of the silvicultural system. So the silvicultural systems are named after the number of age classes uh, that will result uh, from our, our treatment, from uh, our regeneration of the forest. Uh, so the number of age classes uh, is meaningful because it tells us a lot about the structure uh, of the forest. Uh, and different structures can uh, help us meet different management objectives. The first system is an even-aged uh, silvicultural system, uh, and this uh, creates and maintains a single layer, a single cohort uh, of trees and the species generally lacking a lot of structural uh, heterogeneity and creating a more homogeneous condition uh, in the stand. Uh, we also have a two-aged system uh, where uh, this is just how it sounds. There's two age classes uh, in, uh, in the forest, so you might have an overstory uh, and then you have a regenerating uh, cohort coming up and generally these, uh, these understory uh, trees that are coming up as a second age co cohort uh, will have uh, some level of shade uh, tolerance that it can grow up underneath the shade and the canopy of, of the, uh, the overstory. Uh, and lastly, we have an uneven age system. Uh, and this is generally characterized as having a lot of stand heterogeneity, structural heterogeneity, where there's multiple age classes from the canopy, the highest trees, all the way down, uh, having mid-story and uh, understory trees. 
So every silvicultural system has three main components. We have regeneration, tending, and harvest. Uh, and these, these three parts work together to create and develop a stand where we're controlling uh, the species composition, the structure of the forest through different tending uh, uh, treatments, uh, and then we have some sort of uh, harvest. Uh, and those harvests uh, are, are named after, uh, after the type uh, of regeneration that might take place. Right? So we have different uh, even-aged or uneven-aged systems in the way that we harvest trees out of the forest, uh, the overstory trees will dictate the future structure uh, of the forest. So oftentimes we combine even-aged treatments and two-aged treatments into uh, a general group. Uh, and within, within this system, this even age systems, there's three primary uh, methods for creating an even aged forest. Uh, there's clear cutting, there's a seed tree method, uh, and there's the shelter wood method. And the clear cutting, uh, as, it, uh, as you uh, are likely aware of, is removing all of the overstory trees and then regenerating a new uh, cohort of trees. And generally these new cohort of trees uh, will be very shade intolerant. That means that they like full sunlight uh, and those species that grow best under full sunlight will be the ones uh, that um, develop in, in this new cohort. The seed tree method is another uh, silvicultural method uh, within the even-aged system, right? And so the seed tree involves uh, removing a uh, majority of the overstory except for a few high-quality trees that will be left to seed the understory. And generally this works best for shade intolerant species because there's going to be a lot of open area, a lot of sunlight coming into the forest floor. And so if we leave the speed with we leave trees uh, of species that are shade tolerant, that means that those species will do best uh, when regenerating. If we have species uh, that uh, prefer the shade, uh, the seed tree method uh, would not be appropriate uh, because we're not going to get or recruit uh, the desirable uh, species that we're trying to regenerate because they can't compete with those species that uh, love uh, growing in full sunlight. Uh, and our last even aged method uh, is the shelter wood. Uh, and the shelter wood is generally comprised of three parts. Uh, there's an optional preparatory cut which uh, prepares uh, the forest uh, for, uh, for treatment. Uh, this could be tending, uh, removing some um, uh, invasive plants uh, or any, any plants or trees that are, are going to affect the quality of the growth of our new regenerating stand. Uh, then we have our establishment uh, cut, uh, which removes uh, uh, quite a bit of the overall volume of the stand, but leaves enough uh, trees that provides shelter for this new growing cohort uh, underneath uh, in, the, in the understory. We generally have a, uh, what's called a selection system, and we can have single tree selection uh, and group uh, selection. When we talk about single tree selection, uh, we're identifying individual trees to remove uh, from the forest. So this is a much higher intensity uh, silvicultural method uh, and it requires a lot of detail in going through and marking specific trees uh, to help us meet a specific uh, age uh, size structure within the forest. Uh, alternatively, we can uh, do what's called a group selection, where you're going in and identifying, ad identifying groups uh, of trees and removing those trees uh, so that it creates an opening in the forest so a new cohort of trees grows in that opening. And over time, you create multiple layers, uh, multiple openings at different time intervals, and so you'll have a different structure uh, within the forest. Uh, silviculture generally refers to uh, sound forest management uh, to meet specific management objectives. And we have a range of, of uh, forest management objectives uh, that we've talked about in the past uh, within this series of Forestry 101, whether it's related to uh, timber or wildlife uh, or water quality or, or recreation or just enjoying the general uh, aesthetic of the forest. Uh, these are all management objectives uh, and we use silvicultural activities uh, to help uh, meet those management objectives uh, and help us define a course of action uh, to help us ultimately get to where we want to be. And this is what we call a silvicultural prescription.
So a silvicultural prescription is a planned series of activities uh, that takes into account uh, the inventory, the data, uh, everything that's contained within the forest, and then we uh, plan our activities based around what's currently out there, and then we prescribe treatments uh, to meet uh, a future condition or a desired future condition of what we want that forest to look like in the future and we prescribe those treatments to help us get there. And so that's why it's so important uh, to have uh, your management priorities uh, well thought out prior to thinking about how to manage your, your land, right? Uh, and so if you're a woodland owner, uh, thinking about your priorities, uh, what you want out of that forest, and then you can help convey that to a forester or a silviculturist uh, that can come help you uh, uh, articulate uh, and think about actual activities uh, to help meet those uh, objectives and, and priorities uh, within your woodland. Thanks for joining me today uh, and until next time I hope you and your woodlands stay happy and healthy. Thank you, Jacob, for that wonderful video. We greatly appreciate you doing all of these uh, series. And, you know, um, one thing, you know, I want to remind people to, if they have questions, to type them in the chat pod and we'll get them to you. But one thing I wanted to know is um, if, how does uh, civil culture fit in a forestry field or a discipline or how does this work <laughs> exactly? Well, I think a lot of people use you know, civil culture and forestry uh, interchangeably and uh, I would, uh, I would argue, uh, since I am a, a silviculturist and biased, that uh, silviculture is really the heart of forestry, where we're taking a lot of the different components of uh, within the field or discipline of forestry, uh, mm -hmm. and we're considering all of whether it's forest health problems, the the data, the inventory of the forest, and we're uh, assessing the problems or our management objectives and, and prescribing uh, ways to to tend the forest and manipulate it in a way that is most beneficial to the landowner um, or, or whoever's uh, management objectives uh, and desired future conditions that we're trying to meet. So yeah, I'm a little biased, but I think silviculture is, I mean, it really does play a key role in, in how we think about forestry and, and manipulate uh, our forests. Right. And you mentioned a single tree selection and how do landowners know which trees to remove? Well, I will say single tree selection is um, one of the more challenging uh, approaches. Uh, and it's one of those approaches. I didn't, I didn't go into a lot of detail on what's appropriate or not appropriate because we have diverse management objectives. And, is it uh, based on a landowner's it, goals then? It could be, yeah. And so if you're trying to create a lot of different structural characteristics, uh, you're not afraid to get in there uh, and spend a lot of time and, and going in and making a lot of entries, then you can really create a nice uh, heterogeneous stand structure that could serve a lot of uh, functions, whether it's uh, wildlife habitat or uh, just general building in general uh, resiliency uh, to future perturbation or any uncertainty um, with, within that forest. And so uh, generally, when we think about a lot of management out here, we're looking at more shelterwood uh, type treatments and a lot of intermediate treatments such as crop tree, crop tree release and um, forest stand improvement that really improve the overall quality of, of our crop trees or our trees that we eventually want to harvest for some sort of economic gain while, while still maintaining the health of that forest so that the next generation can really benefit from the things that we do uh, today and, and be a healthy forest in the future after uh, we, we remove some of those valuable trees. And so that's, um, I think, a big part of it. And yeah. big you know, I, I was going to say, Jacob, one thing you've been stressing throughout this series is the, the value of getting some professional assistance. And, you know, Renee, when we're thinking about which trees to harvest, you know, it's, in, it's really invaluable to get a forester out there and help you kind of make those decisions because they, you know, each situation is a little bit different. The property is a little bit different. Its history is a little bit different. And what the landowner is trying to achieve may be different. Um, but having a forester out there kind of selecting the trees to be harvested um, and matching the, the harvest prescription up with what your objectives is really kind of going to be your best bet to get the results you want. Yep, for sure. Wonderful. All right. 
Yeah, Jake, appreciate the series. It's really nice. Well, well done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on to our yeah. tree of the week. Yeah, so we have Laurie with us. You know, each week, Laurie, you give us a, a glimpse into one of um, the trees that we have here in Kentucky and with well over 100 species. Um, you're plowing through them and you've got a number of them done, but uh, we got a new one today. Slowly but surely. So, <laughs> yeah, and this week I picked out a tree. Um, it's the Kentucky coffee tree. Many of you are all familiar with it. But I kind of picked it out since this is a little bit of a Halloween edition. We're talking a little bit about that because this is a tree that leafs out late. It's one of the last trees to leaf out and it loses its leaves very early. So it's naked for a good chunk of the year. And it has very coarse branching structure. So it kind of looks like a creepy tree in the <laughs> winter, you know. So that's, that's kind of why I picked it out, although I love the Kentucky coffee tree. Yeah, it, it's a really neat species. Yep. I'm sure you'll get into the story of, and of its prominence here in Kentucky. Exactly. Excellent. All right. Here you go. Right. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the Kentucky coffee tree. Kentucky coffee tree, Gymnocladus dioecus, was at one time the state tree of Kentucky, but it is now the state heritage tree. It is also known as coffee tree, American coffee bean, American coffee berry, and coffee bean tree. It is in the Fabaceae or the pea family, but it does not have the nitrogen-fixing bacterium, the rhizobium species, on its root system in the form of nodules like many trees in the Fabaceae family do. It is one of three species in the genus Gymnocladus. The other two are native to East Asia and Burma, the Chinese coffee tree and the Burmese coffee tree. Kentucky coffee tree is a medium-sized tree that can reach the height of about 70 feet tall. It's relatively fast growing when young, and then the growth rate slows as the tree ages. Kentucky coffee tree's coarse silhouette makes for an interesting landscape tree. Kentucky coffee tree is somewhat uncommon in its native range of the central states, with pockets from Pennsylvania to Nebraska and from Minnesota to Oklahoma. It occurs in parts of Kentucky, typically on limestone soils, especially the bluegrass region. It is adaptable to a variety of soils, but does best in moist, loamy soils and prefers full sunlight. It does tolerate urban pollution and is quite drought tolerant. Kentucky coffee tree has very large, alternately arranged leaves. The leaves are bipinnately compound, which means a leaf that is divided into multiple leaflets with each leaflet further subdivided into smaller leaflets. We also call this doubly compound. The leaves are typically between one to three feet long, and as you can see in the photo, they're really big leaves. The leaflets are ovate in shape with entire or smooth margins. They're green above and slightly paler below during the summer. The tree typically leaves out much later than most of its associates. The leaves tend to be yellowish gold in autumn and they'll drop pretty early. The tree tends to have an open or airy canopy which creates um, more of a semi-shade which is also helpful if you want to grow other plants underneath it. Kentucky coffee tree is dioecious which means there are female trees and there are male trees. The flowers are greenish white in panicles at the tips of branches, which leads to zigzag branching pattern in Kentucky coffee tree. The female flowers are in 8 to 12 inch long panicles, and the male flowers are in 3 to 4 inch long panicles. They bloom late in spring after the leaves have emerged, and they are pollinated by insects including bumblebees, longhorn bees, and butterflies. The fruit is a large woody pot. It's typically three to eight inches long and about one and a half to two inches wide. It's greenish before ripening to a reddish brown. Inside the pod, there are six or more dark brown seeds that are embedded in a sticky pulp. The seeds are reputed to contain a toxic alkaloid, cytosine. The pods can remain on the tree throughout the winter. The seed pods can also be a nuisance in the landscape, especially areas that are regularly mowed. They are very hard and can be shot from a lawnmower running over the fruit. Kentucky coffee tree would not be categorized as an important wildlife tree today. The caterpillars of honey locust moth and the bisected honey locust moth feed on the foliage. And groundhogs have been observed to occasionally browse the seedlings, but other mammals avoid the tree and the fruit, possibly due to the toxicity. Due to this toxicity, it is recommended to not have this tree where there is livestock. There is some speculation that the seed pods may have been eaten by the extinct American mastodon and possibly other Ice Age mammals. 
The bark of Kentucky coffee tree is tannish to grayish brown. It's scaly and develops fissures with scaly ridges. The heartwood of Kentucky coffee tree is orangish to reddish brown and the sapwood is yellowish to white. It is a ring porous species with large early wood pores, those are the ones that are formed in the spring, and numerous small late wood pores, those are the ones that are formed into late summer into the fall. It is reported to be moderately durable to durable and decay resistance. The wood of Kentucky coffee tree, along with black locust and honey locust, is fluorescent when viewed under black light. And Kentucky coffee tree wood tends to be bright, uniform yellow or green. Kentucky coffee tree wood is used for cabinetry, fence post, as a utility wood, and for small turned and carved pieces. It's used as a street tree as far north as Montreal because it resists the harsh winters and de-icing salts. It's also used as a landscape tree because of its attractive winter silhouette, and there are several cultivars including Espresso, Prairie Titan, and Stately Manor. All three of these cultivars are male varieties and therefore do not produce seed pods, which some homeowners find undesirable. The national champion Kentucky coffee tree is in Montgomery, Maryland. It is 198 inches in circumference, 106 feet tall, with a 77 foot crown spread. The Kentucky Champion Kentucky Coffee Tree is in Harrison County. It is 133 inches in circumference, 126 feet tall, with an 87-foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about Champion Trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree Register or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about Kentucky Coffee Tree. The name Kentucky Coffee Tree was promoted by early land developers who wanted to get settlers out to the far west, which included Kentucky at the time. Coffee, a popular beverage, was expensive and hard to find far away from coastal ports, so land developers advertised Kentucky as a place where a tree grew with beans that could be roasted and brewed to make a fine coffee substitute. Although drinkable, the beverage was no substitute for coffee, and the early settlers quickly dropped it as soon as the real thing became available. It's been said that Thomas Jefferson acquired Kentucky coffee tree seeds from General George Rogers Clark, who served as the leader of the militia in Kentucky, which was part of Virginia throughout much of the Revolutionary War. Supposedly, he received the seeds around 1783, which he then planted at Monticello. Several Eastern Native American cultures consumed the beans after roasting, and the beans were used for games like dice and used for jewelry and for ceremonial purposes. Gymnocladus dioecus is the botanical name for the Kentucky coffee tree. Gymnos is the Greek word for naked, and klados is Greek for branch, which refers to the large, coarse branches. And the species name dioecus refers to the tree's dioecious nature. Thank you for joining me to learn more about the Kentucky coffee tree. I hope you get the opportunity to get out in your woodland, local park, or neighborhood, and check out this Kentucky native. Well, Lori, thank you again for that video. And you know, I've, I've got to ask you a question. Okay, so we said the seeds were toxic, but yet people were drinking them. Right, so supposedly <laughs> as you roast them, that, that um, negates that toxicity, that the, the cytosine in the seed. So by roasting them, you, that and coffee. I wouldn't recommend any of that because I wouldn't <laughs> feel comfortable, but that's how Native Americans would eat it. And that's how they made the coffee brew is by roasting those seeds. So, okay. All right. Cause I was like, what is that? What happened? They all died afterwards or what? <laughs> it's definitely a tree though. Like I, like I said in there that you don't, if you've got livestock and stuff, you don't want to probably have that tree in that pasture area because of the toxicity in case yeah. it might eat a pod or anything like that. So all right. Yeah, Laurie, I was surprised at how tall they got, really. You know, I mean, I think typically I've not really seen that many that large, but it was really impressive. That they well, and I think for us, we tend to see them more as a landscape tree. They've been planted, so they're out in an open grown setting and they tend to branch out as opposed to growing taller. You don't find them in a tremendous amount in the forest, but because they are somewhat, while it has a big range, it's not super common in that range. Um, but in a forest setting, it would be push it to grow taller, whereas out in the open, now it just likes to spread out. So, oh, really, really appreciate these segments. Thank you. Well, thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Oh.
Oh, moving on. Oh. Now we're getting into our creepy things <laughs> from our woods. But we it's have, not Dr. Crocker that's <laughs> creepy, Dr. right? No. <laughs> so, we have forest health specialist Ellen Crocker and assistant professor of extension entomology, Jonathan Larson. And they are going to say, talk about creepy things from our woods. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're getting in the Halloween spirit. I don't know about the rest of you, but Jonathan and I, uh, we like those creepy things in the woods, right? We sure do. They're awesome to see. I, I, you know, creepy is subjective. It's not necessarily universal. So hopefully yeah. we pick some things they like. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, there are so many different fun, weird, creepy, uh, delightful things in the woods that it's hard to pick sometimes. Yes. But we, we tried to pick a few that we thought you all might like and be interested in. Um, so to start us off, I've got uh, one for you with a really creepy name, Dead Man's Fingers. And this sounds like something that, um, you know, you might accidentally find in the woods and be terrified of. And it kind of looks like that. Um, but really, the name is a little a little bit uh, of a misnomer there. So I'm going to share a quick video about Dead Man's Fingers. Oh, wait, let's see. Make sure I'm sharing the right one. Here we go. So it's almost Halloween, so it's time for some spooky things in the woods. And uh, this is one that maybe sounds a little bit more intimidating than it actually is when you see it. This is Dead Man's Fingers. Um, it, it does kind of look like Dead Man's Fingers, you know, coming out of the, the ground. Um, but if you pull this up, what you'll see is that these are actually mushrooms. These are the fungal fruiting bodies of a fungus that's growing in this dead piece of wood. This mushroom, uh, the fungus that's making it is actually eating that wood, so it's decaying that uh, woody material. And you might find it in the woods, you might find it in your yard, in some mulch. Um, and despite having a really scary name, it's not particularly scary for us. Uh, and it has this very kind of tough, woody structure, woody feel to it. Um, and it can look a little bit differently depending on if it's sporulating, um, or right now if it's pure black, uh, like these ones are. Um, but always a fun find in the woods and appropriate this time of year. Yeah, so if you find dead man's fingers, don't be afraid. They're not actually dead man's fingers. Um, it's a mushroom in the woods. It's not going to you... grab my ankle as I hike by? <laughs> Only in your nightmares. Okay. <laughs> so let me stop this and bring us back. So that was my first uh, one that I wanted to share with you all, but Jonathan's got a few other scary things for you. I sure do. So we always get a lot of questions about spiders here in the autumn. This can be just from curious people who've gone outside and sometimes it's from people who find them inside of their home or in their garage. So I just wanted to share some of the autumnal spiders here today, the autumnal arachnids maybe if I wanna be alliterative. Uh, we see a lot of folks that bring us, in particular on the right there, that's the Dolomites fishing spider. And this is one of our larger spiders that we see in this part of the country. And they like wooded areas, despite the name, which kind of implies that they'd want to be near a stream or a pond. They will venture into wood lots and they'll venture into wooded areas and take advantage of all the different things that they can find and eat there. They are quite large. As you can see on this person's thumb, I would not uh, advise doing this. They are not hazardous in terms of what they would do to you if they bit you. Most spider venom is a lot like bee venom and you're not gonna experience a lot of negative effects, but it's also sort of courting disaster, I think, just to put a spider like that on your hand. Um, on the left, that's the banded garden web spider or the zipper spider, some people call it. This is an orb weaver that's famous for its abdomen, which is black and yellow. I think it looks like a skull or maybe like a creepy monster face is hidden there. But I also think it's really beautiful. I have a large photograph of this and it hangs in my office. It was a garage sale find that I'm quite proud of. And they do this thing where they'll bounce in their web and try to scare you off because they think that you're there to eat them. That zipper down the middle, those zigzags, we call that in the web, the stabilimentum. We used to think that it had something to do with keeping the web steady, but more current research seems to indicate that it's more of a warning to birds or things that are flying quickly that they need to course correct so they don't end up stuck in the spider's web. I know that's a creepy experience many of us have had out in the woods. You're walking and suddenly 
your face is covered by a spider web and you quickly become a ninja and try to pop all that off of you. So most of these species that we encounter, like the orb weaver, they have an annual life cycle. They'll die at the end of the year and their children are the ones that will go into the next year as eggs. Some species like the fishing spider and some of our wolf spiders though, they can live up to two years. Uh, the purse web spider would be another example. And so you'll see these adults retreating to overwinter or you'll see sort of a semi-adult, a juvenile that will retreat under a rock or into your basement and they'll be hanging out over the winter trying to survive those cold temperatures. On the next slide, we've got some pictures of the baby spiders. They start as spiderlings. I included this GIF just because I know it kind of creeps people out. Uh, there's lots of spiders on the back of this mama. She is carrying them around. A lot of spiders actually exhibit a form of childcare like this. They'll keep their kids safe by shuttling them places. And so if you step on a spider, sometimes we get these phone calls of people that say it exploded into a million little spiders. And so you killed their mom and now they're all running around in your house, basically. That's what's happening. And then on, uh, on the other hand, we have things like a black widow spider on the right there, which they make their egg sac and then they die. They don't live very, very long after that. That female will make several of these and she'll never meet those children. They'll hatch the next year and start the whole cycle over again. And then on the last spider slide that I've got here, we've just got some of the more dangerous ones that we deal with in the state. Like I said, most spiders you don't really need to worry about. They don't cause a lot of issues. We have two that we consider dangerous in this state, black widows and the brown recluses. They're dangerous for different reasons. The black widow has a neurotoxin. People I've spoken to that have been bitten by one, they describe it as the worst flu they've ever had in their life. They hallucinated, they had fevers and chills and they were hospitalized. But we haven't had a recorded death from widows for I think over a hundred years, maybe even close to 150 years. And then recluses on the other hand, when they bite you, their venom is sort of the traditional necrotizing venom. It dissolves cells. And so you get this small divot that appears in your skin. The problem is that most people don't go to the doctor and then that gets infected with MRSA or something and you get this big gaping wound. It's not necessarily the spider's fault, it's more of a bacteria kind of thing, but the brown recluse gets a lot of blame and a lot of people are freaked out by it. Have you ever seen either of these, Alan? I've seen a black widow once okay. um, and uh, a brown recluse on the table of an entomologist who had it in a little jar and thought it was very funny to keep on the table. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna stand over here now. <laughs> that sounds like entomologist humor. We have several recluses in the entomology zoo right now. Uh, we keep them heavily taped up and there's little signs on there that say, do not open. Uh, we you don't also escape, have you don't just find them around your office. We've never seen them <laughs> escape into the, I mean, I'm sure they're in Ag Science North. They have to be in the walls and stuff, but no, we haven't had any escapees from our zoo. Oh, yet, yet. yet. Oh, <laughs> Knock on wood. Gosh, no, thank you. <laughs> Well, what's your uh, next one? You got another cool one. I've got mushroom, one right? for us that's uh, kind of right in line with what you've been describing in terms of, uh, you know, having some really adverse impacts on the people who eat it. So um, have you heard of the destroying angel mushroom um, before? I have. I mean, I've heard of destroying angels when I was growing up and going to Catholic school and everything, but I haven't heard necessarily <laughs> of this mushroom. So destroying angel, there are several different mushrooms that are referred to as the destroying angel. And they're actually different species depending on where you live, um, the East Coast, West Coast, Europe, um, but they get their name for a really good reason. And they have toxins in them that if you eat them, uh, you'll feel fine at first and then maybe four or five hours later, you'll feel incredibly sick, a lot of GI distress, um, and you'll feel terrible. And then things get better and you're like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm fine. Maybe that's no big deal. Um, but what's really happening is that your liver and kidneys are being destroyed. And oh. so 90% uh, of the people who eat this mushroom uh, do die um, and or need, require a liver transplant. So it's Holy very cow. serious. And even a tiny amount of it um, can make you extremely, extremely sick. 
Um, so I think this is this is a scary mushroom uh, for Halloween, and also one of the reasons why you really don't want to be eating mushrooms unless you know what you're eating and you've you know, verified that you don't have something like this. At the same time, it's kind of beautiful. Uh, so we've got a short video that I can share um, about this mushroom. It does grow in this area and you can find it around. We found some uh, recently growing and uh, you'll learn a little bit more about the destroying angel. This beautiful white mushroom is Amanita bisporidura. And this is the destroying angel mushroom. It's a rather infamous mushroom. You may have heard of it. Every year, this little guy is responsible for at least several deaths uh, from people consuming this mushroom, believing it to be edible, when in fact, this is one of the most deadly poisonous mushrooms that we have here in North America. Amanita bisporidra is, as you may have guessed, a member of the Amanita group. Is, this is evident by the bulbous base to this mushroom, as well as the annulus that surrounds the stipe. These are classic features of Amanita fungi. Now keep in mind that not all Amanitas have these features. And there are other mushrooms aside from Amanita that will have that bulbous base or that will have an annulus. But those two features together are very um, characteristic of Amanita fungi. The Destroying Angel is a beautiful, pure white mushroom. There are no other colors on this mushroom when it is pristine and in good shape. It will be completely pure white. It has a very long stipe, uh, that annulus and that bulbous base, and the spore print on this mushroom would be white. This is a mushroom that you never want to eat, and if it is a mushroom that by some chance you believe you may have consumed, you do want to seek immediate medical attention because this mushroom is, is deadly poisonous. Despite its reputation as a deadly poisonous mushroom, this mushroom is only poisonous if you ingest it. Touching this mushroom will not hurt you. It's not something that can be absorbed through your skin, although I would advise not licking your hands after you've been handling any mushrooms ever. <laughs> So that's uh, Megan Buland. If you don't recognize her, she works me, with me in the Forest Health Extension Group, and we're getting together a series of videos on some different mushrooms to share with you all. Um, but that's the destroying angel mushroom. Solid advice. Don't lick your hands after holding mushrooms. Yeah, just don't. Yeah. Just don't. You know, it, it, no mushroom is worth uh, the risk or even the worry about it. You can go to the grocery store and find mushrooms. Yeah, they're pretty um, but, cheap usually, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that's the destroying angel. Um, not to be confused with the death cap, which is in the same family and will also kill you. So I don't know why people eat mushrooms is what I'm learning <laughs> here, I guess. Uh, the second thing that I pulled up for us is I know that next year we've already been getting some questions about this. People are preparing for the 2021 emergence of the periodical cicada. They're part of genus Magis cicada, which I think is a really great scientific name. And these are, I think these are amazing, wonderful insects, but to a lot of other folks, this is terrifying because there's gonna be billions of bugs boiling up out of the ground next summer, basically. Uh, these are the cicadas that live below the soil as nymphs for about 13 years or 17 years, depending on the species. And then they will come above ground during one summer and they will mate and feed and lay their eggs. They are the longest living insect in North America. Uh, they're second only overall to, I would say, termite queens in some of the more tropical parts of the world or desert parts of the world, which can live 20, 25 years. But on the next slide, you can see that we've got uh, some maps that we put together of these cicadas, and we call them by their brood. So Kentucky is mostly covered by what we call brood X, which I think also sounds a little creepy. It sounds like something from a 1950s horror film or from Marvel Comics. And Brood X last emerged in 2004. So back in that time, we were having another presidential election, G.W. Bush versus John Kerry, who actually had the Olympics that year. They were in Athens. The Boston Red Sox won their first uh, pennant in, I think, over 100 years at that point. They broke the curse of the Bambino. Shrek 2 was the number one movie. Big shout out to any Shrek fans out there. And so these insects that came out that summer mated laid their eggs, and then those nymphs have been below ground since that time, and they've been feeding very slowly. In Kentucky, the counties that are most likely to be affected by this emergence will be Boone, Breckenridge, Bullitt, Carroll, Davies, Gallatin, Grayson, Henry, 
Jefferson, LaRue, McLean, Muhlenberg, Nelson, Ohio, Oldham, and Trimble. My apologies if I mispronounced any of those. I am not a native Kentuckian, but those are the ones that we'll generally see this happen in. They can happen in other spots. They generally like the more river corridor type counties and places that have a lot of old forest growth because they need trees that have been around for a long time. After that, uh, on the next slide, I think we've got some GIFs here of them moving. So what happens is at night, a signal will alert them that it's time to come up out of the soil. This usually happens in mid-May up until about mid-June. This cicada nymph, you can see it's a magic cicada because of those red piercing eyes on the head. This is called, they have a phenomenon called gravitaxis, which tells them to go up, 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 up as high as you can, and then shed their exoskeleton. And we'll see these shells that they leave behind on fence posts and mailboxes, anything that's standing still, basically. If you've never seen a cicada emerge, that's the next gif that I have, is one pulling itself out of its shell, uh, or it's a little video, I guess. This is a interesting phenomenon. I think they pull themselves up out of their exoskeleton. We find all of these different shells sitting to the, on the treetops, and it's a it's a really cool process that they go through. I feel like uh, that's part of like my childhood was like finding them, yeah. and watching them. Uh, the shells are really cool. I, I've seen these really interesting photos over the last summer where people, I guess, they were bored and they're making art with them, and they were making masks where they were kind of knitting <laughs> them together and making a fake wig. This can't be CDC shows. approved. <laughs> it, it, I wouldn't imagine that it, yeah, it wouldn't block out the coronavirus, no, but uh, it definitely looked pretty neat. So they pull themselves up out of the exoskeleton. A lot of them will perish doing this, but there's so many of them that some of them will get to go to adulthood. Uh, this is when they will start singing. The males are the ones that create the song. The females will click their wings at him in order to uh, acquiesce to the mating. But then once she's mated, she'll start to lay her eggs. And this is maybe the creepy part to all of you tree folks out there, I think, is some of the pictures on the next slide. Where they will start to cut these slits in the branch tips and the female will inject her eggs into there. You can see those eggs in that inset picture. They look like grains of rice. And as she does this, it's not too damaging to the tree, but when you've got a million bugs doing this, you're gonna start to see it accumulate. And we'll see this flagging in the trees where there's lots of these sort of limped over tips of branches. If it's a big mature tree, we don't generally see any lasting effects from this. They just fall out of the tree and the tree keeps on trucking the next year. If it's a new tree in the landscape that's just been planted or a young fruit tree somebody's tending to, this is something we worry about more. Uh, they generally like oak, apple, hickory, dogwood, and mountain ash. Again, some of those longer lived species that we see in there. Um, if you are worried about this, you can put netting over the tree. I think I think that's the last thing I have a picture of on the next slide. Nope. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I don't oh, see that's it. That's my fault. But uh, how do you get the netting up in that tree? Do you shoot it so up? <laughs> we typically are trying to just get people to net those small trees. If it's okay. a big tree, it's just, it just happens once every 17 years. You just kind of have to deal with it and you have to deal with the noise. If it's a small tree, a newly transplanted tree, an apple tree you're trying to take care of, that bird netting or closer knit netting than that even will help to keep the females from being able to lay their eggs. We try to talk people out of spraying for them. You can't eat them. I, when I lived in Nebraska, they had a big cook-off for them when they came out in Omaha and somebody was trying to brew beer with them. I don't <laughs> know how that worked uh, and I don't know if it ever came out, but I do know that this is a long tradition. There's lots of stories of people eating the cicadas when they come out. Okay, so next year when they come out, we're going to do uh, cooking with cicadas. Yeah, I think that would be great. Today. That can be yep. the next. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> That'll be my next appearance on the show. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to that for sure. I've never tried a cicada um, and, and I'm, I'm game to give it a go. It's, it's nutty. It's the best way I can describe it. Uh, so we have one more thing to show you and that's the jack-o-lantern mushroom. And other than being orange, I don't think it bears much resemblance to the jack-o-lantern, uh, you know, our iconic um, uh, pumpkin this time of year. Uh, but one cool thing about jack-o-lanterns, well, two cool things. Um, first off, they are poisonous. So this is another mushroom you do not want to eat. You will get very sick. And they look kind of similar to chanterelle. So sometimes people confuse the two. Um, but these tend to grow in big clumps at the base of a tree or on some woody material. 
Um, whereas chanterelles are going to be growing kind of more um, uh, singularly um, on the forest floor. And you wouldn't really see them growing like that. Another thing is you can see that while both of them um, kind of look like they have gills that go down the stem and have that orangey color, um, these are true gills. They kind of look like tiny little blades, whereas chanterelles are kind of more uh, like wrinkled veins. Um, so that's, that's one thing to know about the difference with the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Another neat thing is that they are thought to be bioluminescent. So if you were to get really lucky wandering through the woods one night, you might see these mushrooms glowing at night. Um, and I'm gonna be honest though, everyone, I have never seen this. This is not my photo. Um, and I think this is a photo with a really long exposure where somebody really got that well, because maybe you'll see a faint glow, um, but I've never seen them this, this um, obvious, but, but maybe another creepy thing to look for next time you're in the woods. So with that, um, thanks for joining us on this little, little foray into creepy things in the woods. Well, all I can say, you two, is it's a good thing my camera and mic weren't on because there were several times I was like, ah, <laughs> watching this. And I'm sure our viewers were doing the same thing. But thank you all for doing this. We greatly appreciate it. I see we had a question about a mushroom identification site, a website, and I'd have a couple of resources for everyone. Um, so I highly encourage if you're interested in mushrooms, um, check out uh, the Bluegrass Mycological Society's Facebook page. It's a great resource and you can post what you're seeing and see what other people are seeing. Another thing that I'd recommend is checking out mushroomexpert.com. It's a great free key uh, that you can go through and answer questions about what you're seeing and what it might be. Now, unfortunately, there's no uh, quick and easy way to determine, you know, what a mushroom is and whether or not it's poisonous. Really, what you've got to do is you've got to identify everything you see to species every time um, because, you know, it's really easy to make a mistake. And while most of the time you're probably fine, um, as I mentioned today, there are some mushrooms you really don't want to um, confuse. Yeah. Ellen, Jonathan, very entertaining segment and a very fitting for this time of year. I appreciate that. Um, so that was, that was really fun. Thank you all very much. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, moving no, no. on, we have a wildlife sounds from the forest. Dr. Matt Springer cannot be here today, but um, him and I uh, videoed something yesterday, and um, it's uh, some wildlife creepy sounds. So um, we can go ahead and show that. All right, I'll go ahead and pull it up, Renee. Welcome to another edition of Wildlife Sounds. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with uh, Matt Springer and he's the Extension Wildlife Specialist. And I know a lot of people already know your name and face, Matt. Um, we're gonna do like a creepy edition, just some sounds today, right? Yeah, we're gonna stick with that Halloween theme and, and put a little wildlife twist on it. That's for sure. Sounds good. All right, so you have several sounds for us today. Yeah, I've, I tried to pick some of the ones that are, are uh, a little bit eerie if you hear them, especially if you're out walking the woods at night. Um, mm -hmm. They can at least, you know, some of them might send some chills up your spine. Um, if you know what they are, they may not anymore. Uh, right. Maybe some of them still will, depending on the situation. So, uh, but yeah, I've got uh, four different species that I thought were uh, pretty relevant to this week. Um, so we can, we can go from there whenever you're ready. All right, let's go. So for our first one in our Halloween theme here. Hmm. Any ideas? Well, it's, do, it, do you think it's a mammal, a bird, a, a amphibian? I'm guessing a bird. Okay. Big but bird, little bird. You're Maybe right on bird. A bright on bird, okay. Um, maybe a bigger bird? It, it is a bigger bird. So here's our answer. And oh. for those of you that can't don't recognize this bird, um, it's the barn owl, uh, which was a relatively common raptor uh, previously uh, for our state and, and much of its range in North America. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, though, because of some rodenticide issues and, and a few other things, uh, their populations have crashed, and we have about 50 pairs in the state of Kentucky now. Oh, my. Uh, but they do shriek rather loud. And, and there's several other owls I was kind of playing back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I landed on this one. So do they uh, all have that heart shaped head? All the, uh, the, the barn owls do. Um, wow. Not all owls necessarily have that heart shaped head. Right, but you can tea. tell a barn owl from with a heart shape. 
Uh, yes, that white heart-shaped face there is, is mm -hmm. definitely uh, one that carries through for that, that group of owls. So neat. Yeah. All right, That's let's move on. Spooky noise. <laughs> move on to the next one. That one sounds mad, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's, it, well, so it's more than one and they're disgruntled. Um, <laughs> and it's definitely one uh, that we hear a lot more, especially if you live around cornfields mm -hmm. uh, or even urban settings or, or uh, suburban settings. Right. Uh, this, this is an animal uh, that is definitely a very common animal in rural or in urban and suburban and agricultural settings. Okay. Um, and actually we're hearing them fight. So... Oh. Oh, raccoon. Ah, yes. The tail gives it away, right? Mm -hmm, definitely. So the actual animals that are fighting are in the background there, so you can't really see them, unfortunately. But this is this is a raccoon scuffle over some food, uh, and one that you do hear quite a bit if you're in the woods, um, especially when those guys are active. Mm -hmm. So a little bit, you know, that not as straightforward. Kind of if you were yeah. outside. <laughs> it is very loud. It, and that I think is the more, that's the part that doesn't carry through here is when, if you hear this, uh, you can hear it from several hundred yards away. Oh, wow. It is, it is a loud scream. And if it's close to you, it really will set you on edge. I bet. <laughs> well, let's go to our next one. Now, our next one, we have three different sounds for this species. Okay. And that's because of the wide variety of noises they'll make uh -huh. um, that, you know, each and every single one of them is kind of a little different, but a little, but each one I think carries some weight here in terms of the eerie factor. So that's our first one. Oh my. That had dinner bell at the end too. <laughs> Now, all of those are slightly wow. different, but... And it's but all the same animal? All the same animal, slightly different moods each time. Uh, a couple of them are communication with each other. One mm -hmm. of them is definitely a defensive growl. Yeah, uh, tell and that. The, other, <laughs> the other one could be a defensive growl and show as well. Um, so, yeah, the, the last two I'd say if you hear, you might be in trouble. Okay. Um, but it's actually pretty closely tied to UK. Oh, Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, and these guys, uh, especially come, uh, late fall, early winter, they come into breeding season mm -hmm. and they make some really weird noises when they're trying to find each other during breeding season. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of, you may hear them at night as they're running around looking for each other. And are they in the cities as well? Uh, so we could, you can, there's definitely places in the country that have urban bobcats, mm -hmm. um, they do quite well um, in suburban settings uh, under certain circumstances. And we actually have bobcats that are just outside of Louisville okay. um, that we're getting more and more reports for. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say um, Lexington, maybe not as much um, because of the high concentration of traffic and, and relatively no amount of um, green space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't have like, you know, we don't see a whole lot of urban deer either in, in Lexington compared to other places, but okay. uh, places like Louisville, Bowling Green, I could definitely see having uh, a lot of bobcats uh, in suburban areas. Okay. So, all right. Well, all right. One more for us. One more. Now this Probably one I've heard, wrong, but that sounds more like a bird. <laughs> but it is it is not a bird, and I, a I've bird. heard nope. I've heard people say it sounds like a kid screaming when you hear it in person. Oh, but yeah. It, it it the sound clip doesn't really do it justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is one that actually I would hear in my backyard in Lexington um, at night uh, or early morning when I was drinking my coffee, getting ready for work. I'd hear this one. It's What's it's this a sound for. Well, so that's a, a communication trying to find its mate. Oh, okay. It's really what it, it's, it's a, it's a, a trying to find its mate and only the mate will actually recognize who that individual is and call back. Oh. So, yeah. 
Well, let's see what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, I've it's, seen those around Lexington quite uh, a bit. We got plenty of them. You can pull up to the Fayette Mall at, at dark there and go behind the food court parking lot uh, be, in between the park and Shalito Park and, and the food court, and you'll find them running around looking for food that was dropped. Yeah, I see so, them at Shalito all the time. <laughs> yeah, they they do quite well in urban settings, and actually um, they used to be in agricultural settings a lot too, uh, but with coyotes um, numbers increasing, they've really knocked fox populations back quite a bit because they do not get along. Oh. Yeah. So, but this is just a sample of a few of the weird wildlife sounds I figured would go with our theme this week. Um, obviously we, you know, I could probably fill this show entire show up with them. Um, but, but I didn't want to lose it, miss out on the fun. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on this, uh, little bit of a guess, a creepy edition of, <laughs> of from the woods today. All right. Take care. Well, we hope you all have enjoyed our uh, creepy edition. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot of stuff and I'm sure you all have too. Um, make sure anytime you want to rewatch one of our shows, go to fromthewoodstoday.com and you can see them there. And next week, um, Ellen is going to actually be talking more on mushrooms. And um, so that'll be a, a fun segment to be able to hear more about. Oh. But uh, Billy, it seems like we're, we've done for today. We've done a good one. I want to brag on you and Matt for a nice segment there that was entertaining and fun. I was sitting there trying to guess myself. I'm like, all right, what is that? So uh, that yeah, was I saw a lot of people put in the chat pod what they thought it was. Yeah. I loved it. You yeah. Know? No, good job, guys. Really nice work. And again, folks, we appreciate y'all being with us each and every week. Um, please help us spread the word about this program. We think a lot of people would find it of interest um, if they knew about it. So please help us spread the word about From the Woods Today. I um, mean, you can check us out online, from the woods today com and um, to catch all the previous recordings. So again, Renee, great job. Thank you all for being with us this week. Yep. We greatly appreciate it and join us again next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Until then, take care.